what I'll do is tell you about one um, project that's overtaken our lab in the recent year or so, uh, which kind of diverged off from other objectives in the lab and has been occupying our attention. And we think we can provide a new way to look at experience-dependent plasticity taking a molecular perspective. Um, <coughs> so I, I'm not sure I need to, to say this to this audience, especially since most of you have heard me before, but uh, let's, let's make the common assumption, let's share the assumption between us that experience-dependent plasticity underlies all adaptive behaviors, that we use common substrates, common mechanisms of experience-dependent plasticity of synaptic modifications and um, other changes that we'll discuss soon in order to encode experiences. And we utilize these, we can think of examples when we're uh, testing our orientation in the world and our interaction with animate and inanimate objects in the world, when we're uh, forming habits, including maladaptive habits, when we're um, creating preferences, let's say, for foods, and also creating maladaptive habits in, in that context. Uh, the common thought is that we're using similar substrates in order to encode all these experiences, create the different habits, and uh, develop the subsequent behaviors. So in this context, the very simple-minded um, and easy-to-follow hypothesis that we uh, look uh, that we use in the lab is that you start off with an experience. The experience causes neural activity. Neural activity causes gene expression. Gene expression is at least in part responsible for the modification in neuronal function that underlies the encoding of the experience, which then underlies the modified behavior. What we'll be focusing on in the next I hope 25 to 30 minutes is uh, the gene expression, this layer of this simple um, paradigm. So when we look at gene expression, and this is globally true across every cell type in the body, every type of stimulus, we see a common phenomena. This is not very uh, commonly known. It's not es uh, fully established in the scientific community, but uh, it's pretty robust that almost every stimulus, almost every cell will give you a very uh, consistent response. And the response is organized in waves, where you have, uh, here we're looking at single genes and rows and time points and columns, and you, the color coding is <coughs> high, is uh, High level of expression is in red, low level is in blue. So we see waves of transcription where you have a small component of very fast genes that are turned on, then a later component that's turned on a second wave, another wave, and then a subsequent accumulation of proteins. When we look at the identity of these genes, then they actually segregate very well functionally. And you see an early component uh, of immediate early genes that are uh, primarily forward-acting transcription factors and negative regulators of signaling. And we can call this a computational event that the cell utilizes in order to decode the signaling event that happened and encode the subsequent uh, change that it's going to undertake. And then later on, uh, we see waves of effector genes, which are also functionally clustered um, and these are the genes that are going to implement the change that the cell has decided that it's going to take. Now, if we take this approach, then we can look only at these immediate early genes and think of them as these gatekeepers of the encoding of the phenomena that we want to, uh, that, that the, the brain or the cell is looking to encode, and that's the approach that we're going to be taking in. So we're funneling now to, to the, the rest of the talk. We'll be discussing this early component of immediate early genes. The uh, experience that we started off with is the experience of uh, drugs of abuse, of cocaine. <coughs> the reason to use cocaine as an experience 
uh, is first of all that it, it's helpful in getting funding. Um, the addiction is tr really a major problem in society today. Uh, but from the experimental perspective, it has many advantages in that you can work with a substance that's foreign to the organism that you're working with, and you can have very high level of control over the experience that the animal gets when you're working with such a substance. Furthermore, the circuitry, the reward circuitry on which cocaine acts, is very well established in terms of what the major uh, players are. And if we look at these major players, then we have uh, the nucleus accumbens. I assume that most of you were in Christian Lucher's talk yesterday, but since I wasn't there, I'm not absolutely certain what he was talking about, but I can venture a guess that he did mention the reward circuitry in the nucleus accumbens, which integrates different um, components of uh, the memory that goes into uh, different features of the experience of drugs of abuse in order to encode the memory of, uh, of the uh, drug. So we have input from the prefrontal cortex that um, provides information regarding executive control of function. The contextual information is provided by the hippocampus. The amygdala provides information regarding the emotion, um, emotional state of the organism, stress level. Uh, all these are glutamatergic inputs, and then we have a crucial dopaminergic input from the ventral tegmental area, which encodes valence of the experience. Um, so this is pretty well established, and uh, we know even more sub-features of this network, and it gives a nice map within which to work. The first place where people actually looked electrophysiologically to find imprints of an in vivo experience as a synaptic change, a modification of the synapses as a change in um, enhanced uh, AMPA receptor expression at the synapse following an experience or an in vivo correlate of long-term potentiation was the ventral tegmental area, work from uh, Rob Malenka, and this is a slide that I lifted from him. And what uh, they saw was that you see an increase in this measure of AMPA to NMDA ratios on glutamatergic synapses onto dopamine neurons in the VTA one day after cocaine, which was uh, <coughs> nice proof that the uh, experience of cocaine causes a long-term change in connectivity onto the VTA, which uh, would be consistent with the encoding of the experience in the VTA. When they looked further, they saw that amphetamine, morphine, nicotine, ethanol, and other experiences such as acute stress also potentiate synapses onto VTA dopamine neurons. And other people have looked further within the network. Christian Lucher has contributed enormously to decoding the synaptic modifications occurring in the nucleus accumbens in different models of cocaine experience. Um, and still staying within the VTA, we see that uh, cocaine, as well as food, as well as sucrose, all cause an increase in the AMPA to NMDA ratio onto, in synapses onto dopamine neurons in the VTA. So what you see here is a unidimensional parameter which encodes an experience, but there's no, we cannot differentiate between these different experiences. From our experimental perspective, they look identical. You have no way of knowing what the animal actually went through. So when we look at the uh, cocaine experience in the lab, we take the simplest model possible. We take a mouse and we habituate it to saline injections in a novel environment, then um, measure its locomotor activity following an acute exposure to cocaine. You see locomotor activity is elevated, or daily injections of cocaine cause a gradual increase in locomotor activity. Um, and then we can take the mouse, put it back in its home cage, and come back a few weeks later and test its memory of the experience of the drug. And you can see that um, it responds not only to the same level that it had achieved following chronic cocaine exposure, but actually the locomotor activity is even elevated further, uh, demonstrating an incubation of the response. It's something that's well characterized in the system. But 
what I want you to take from this is that this is a very simple behavioral measure to look at the memory in the system uh, it, that's encoded by the experience of the drug. Now, from uh, taking the molecular perspective and looking at transcriptional uh, dynamics, what we do is we look following in, in within each one of these time points, the acute exposure, chronic exposure, or the uh, re-exposure in a previously experienced mouse, and open up a time window within which we study the transcriptional dynamics. And what we see is that if we look here in the nucleus accumbens, we see waves of transcriptional induction here. In this case, um, high is green, low is blue. And we see a nice waves of transcription, which to our surprise were extremely robust, meaning that individual mice gave response that was very similar um, across mice. When we compare the response in a mouse who's experiencing cocaine for the first time to the response in a mouse that is also receiving an acute exposure to cocaine, but this mouse had prior experience of cocaine, and we look at the genes induced, you can already see that the structure of the transcriptional program is slightly, or is shifted between these two, <coughs> um, two programs, these uh, two conditions. When we look at the identity of the genes, then you can see that uh, when you look at genes that are induced following an acute cocaine experience within the data set of the challenge, you see that these genes aren't shared between them. And again, when you look at genes that are induced in an experienced mouse, you look back in the naive mouse and you see that these genes are not induced. So there's a very dramatic rewiring of the transcriptional program that occurs following the exposure, uh, following the experience of, the, of cocaine. This is a, a, a topic of major interest for us in the lab, but I'm not going to discuss this further. Now I'm going to go off on the tangent which has been occupying us for the past year or so. And in this tangent, what we uh, focused on were these immediate early genes. And we compared the acute response to either an additional exp uh, experience of saline or that of cocaine, which causes this nice elevation locomotor activity, to the response to cocaine in a pr previously experienced mouse, or an interesting time point, which is uh, you re-expose the mouse to the same environment, same handling of the investigator, just instead of cocaine, you give it saline. So it, uh, you see a representation of its expectation to receive cocaine in this condition. This an, it's an internal representation. In these mice, what we did is uh, try to maximize the uh, number of structures that we're looking at maximize the information content per mouse. So we started off by profiling uh, accumbens, striatum, and prefrontal cortex, and then gradually added on additional structures like the hippocampus, the lateral hypothalamus, the amygdala, and most recently the ventral tegmental area, which is the most challenging. Looking in the nucleus accumbens, and now every column is an individual mouse, and here we have uh, a few tens of genes. Um, what we saw is that a very small number of immediate early genes is actually induced by the experience of cocaine within the accumbens, but once they're induced, they're very consistently induced. So the response is very robust and uh, very reliable between across mice. So we have a readout that um, is extremely consistent <coughs> for the response of a mouse to a particular experience. And it's even true when you look within this two-hour time point where the um, signal is much weaker, you can still see how consistent it is across mice. When we uh, look at this a little bit differently, then uh, we look at this classic immediate early gene FOSS, which is used as a marker of neuronal activity. Um, it's globally used as a marker. And you can see that it very clearly differentiates between uh, re-exposure to saline and an acute exposure to cocaine, suggesting that uh, perhaps the re-exposure to saline is not salient for the mouse. The mouse does not, the, the neurons in the nucleus accumbens do not make a decision to go into transcription. Perhaps transcription 
is a measure of salience of an event, which kind of um, is, is something that relates to Kobe's talk before me, where he's talking about this uh, transient salience w in sucrose, and we'll, we'll come to that exact experiment soon. When we look at another gene, EGR2, which has not been characterized in the system, then we see also very pronounced induction um, following acute cocaine, and here you can see the individual responses, so you can get the impression of how uh, robust it is per individual mouse. When we look now within um, mice that again receive an acute exposure to cocaine, but the difference being that they had prior experience of cocaine, you again see a very small subset of genes being induced, and you can um, see that the induction is shifted versus the genes that are induced following uh, acute cocaine exposure. Again, we're only focusing here on these immediate early genes that we know there's a chance that they'll be induced at these time points. And we, now we're starting to see some interesting features. We see that FOSS is induced to precisely the same level uh, in these two cocaine experiences, whereas EGR2 is differentially induced. So it's uh, only induced following the acute experience and much more weakly induced in the challenge. And you can very clearly see that these mice can be segregated based on their induction of EGR2. So this suggested to us that maybe we can use transcription as a way in to seeing how experiences are encoded differentially within brain regi regions to which they're relevant. So we went on to try another type of experience, which is that of uh, feeding, since the accumbens is an integrator of many features of food intake, and the experiment is extremely easy to perform in a, in a robust way. And what, so we took the food away from the mouse, and then we gave it back to them 24 hours later, and we looked at the inductions of genes in, th in these mice that were re-exposed to food. And again, what we see is that the induction of FOSS is precisely to the same level as it was following these other uh, experiences, the, the two cocaine experiences that we looked at, whereas the induction of EGR2 is uh, reminiscent of that that you see for the acute cocaine response, but uh, differs in its dynamics. So when now we're starting to accumulate more and more uh, experiences. Right now we're up to 15 different discrete behavioral experiences. When we plot these on a three-dimensional plot, either uh, performing principal component analysis or taking individual genes, like in this case, these three genes, and here you only see a subset of the experiences, you, and each dot here is an individual mouse, you can see that the mice segregate beautifully into their groups based on the three-dimensional data obtained from gene expression. So the gene expression can serve as an indicator for the recent experience of the mouse, and here uh, we tested that, so using a machine learning algorithm, we looked whether we can decode the uh, recent experience of the mouse based on gene expression, and uh, right now we're at above 90% uh, prediction accuracy, and this is just becoming better the more experiences we include and the more genes. So basically, we'd like to propose um, this approach of behavioral transcriptomics as another uh, complementary way of looking at the encoding of experiences in the brain. Um, the transcriptional induction is robust, reliable, and highly invariable. It's amazing how little variation you see and how consistent it is between different researchers and uh, seasons and other variables. The information you get is very, very rich. So for every mouse, you can profile multiple brain regions and uh, look genome-wide. Surprisingly, once the system is established, it's quite inexpensive. and um, High, very, very importantly, it's amenable to mechanistic investigation, meaning you have now genes that you can start thinking about associating with features of an experience, and that gives you a handle. You can uh, investigate them in vivo within particular structures. And it provides an additional layer of information beyond what 
you get when you look uh, electrophysiologically. So up till now, I told you, um, the uh, I described the work of Diptendu, who is a PhD student in the lab. Uh, he was joined by Bogna, who's a, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, who started looking, using this approach, at different experiences. So she chose a number of aversive experiences and rewarding experiences to, to see how far we can extend the information we gain from this approach. Started off using lithium chloride, which was uh, described very well in detail by Kobe recently, an hour ago. And what she saw is that um, following an, an acute exposure to lithium, now she's profiling many different brain structures, and what you see here is just a way of plotting the information for three genes at a time uh, per structure. So the extent that, uh, let's say, this triangle extends to this axis, it just indicates the induction of EGR2, the extension to this axis, the induction of FOSS, and uh, towards the top is this other gene, EGR4. The gray um, triangles are the individual mice. So this uh, demonstrates, again, the robustness of the phenomena where you see this beautiful induction in the amygdala, which is the structure you'd expect to respond to uh, lithium chloride. Um, nothing actually going on in the striatum, very little PFC, uh, et cetera. The, when she looked at a uh, rewarding experience, she was actually initially quite surprised. So she gave mice uh, a single exposure to sucrose, exactly like Kobe told us before. Kobe, I now learn, fails to see induction of transcription in the cortex. Bogna failed to see induction of transcription in the structures that she looked at. So she thought, OK, I'll give the mice um, an additional experience of sucrose before I profile. So she habituated them overnight and uh, to, to the sucrose bottle and then profile transcription after 20 minutes of exposure to the bottle. And she saw some level of induction, but it, she still wasn't satisfied. So she gave them 10 daily exposures to uh, the bottle with sucrose, allowing them to establish a habit of sucrose consumption and then uh, profiled. And what she saw was a very robust induction in the prefrontal cortex and in the dorsal stratum, which again can be consistent with uh, the idea that there's a habit being formed here. When we look at the, uh, now what, so we have data for these large number of different experiences, which we now can compare and contrast and try to see if we get uh, additional features coming up about how experiences are encoded utilizing this approach. When we look within the accumbents following an acute exposure to either cocaine or lithium chloride, you can see that they differ in the profiles induced as they do in the striatum. But surprisingly, uh, prefrontal cortex, you see the exact same uh, induction following either an aversive or a rewarding experience. When you now repeat, you give a repeated exposure and you profile again, you see that actually the accumbents now aligns beautifully well, which uh, I can hand wave and suggest that this might have to do with a reward prediction where the mouse actually has an expectation for a certain type of experience. And when that expectation is met, this is the profile that you might see. Obviously, this is something that uh, will need to be tested and is quite tricky to test. Uh, in the striatum, you see highly differential expression, which for cocaine is very consistent with the literature where um, it's thought that there, there's a model for the spiral of addiction where uh, the information is exported from the uh, accumbents to the stratum uh, during the formation of the habit and we see this very strong induction there. And um, also in the prefrontal cortex we see a segregation in the way the mouse responds either to an aversive or rewarding experience when the experience is an expected one. Okay, so um, now we have all these different experiences and here you're only seeing a, a subset of them and we can organize them according to the induction within the different structures and uh, <laughs> cluster them according to rewarding experiences where you see this high level of induction 
in accumbens and striatum or aversive experiences where you see uh, a more significant component in the amygdala or uh, we can look at contingent versus non-contingent trying to tease out which brain regions would be relevant to which type of experience. Where are we going with this? So if we go back to this circuit, uh, you can see here there that if, let's say, we're now focusing only on nucleus accumbens. So nucleus accumbens integrates this different information. All of these are glutamatergic inputs. They would cause the relevant cells in the accumbens to fire. Uh, in contrast, the dopaminergic input uh, would cause some signaling at the synapses of the neurons in the accumbens. Potentially, these two layers of input, the dopaminergic input and the glutamatergic input, causing cell firing would uh, cause very different transcriptional profiles, which we would be able to segregate and then look at individual features within these profiles and give a relative value to the input through this dopaminergic uh, pathway coming in versus these other inputs, and by that, looking within, only within this region, we would be able to get information about circuit level changes within a brain region. Uh, beyond that, what we, what we think we already can say is that perhaps uh, transcription within a region, if you have transcriptional induction, it's a uh, measure of the valence of the uh, salience, sorry, of the experience and the uh, importance, relative importance of plasticity in that particular region for the encoding of the experience. So just to reiterate that, in, uh, and this is, uh, I have this disclaimer up here, this is hypothetical, and I anticipate many years of hard work to actually establish whether we're right or wrong, probably we're wrong, but maybe hopefully we're right also on some of the uh, ideas that we're proposing. So what we hope is that a transcription can serve as a proxy for plasticity within a relevant brain region. Uh, transcription is induced as a measure of salience for an experience. So let's say as you saw for CFOS, CFOS may only indicate salience of, a, of an experience and other genes may indicate different aspects, different features of an experience. So perhaps, and this is now completely hand-waving, EGR2 may be notifying of the novelty of an experience. Other genes such as EGR4, which are induced when uh, we have an anticipate, when we meet an anticipation, uh, could be induced only under those conditions. Um, so what we'd like to, what we're hoping is that features of an experience are encoded by expression of particular genes in relevant brain regions. Cell firing versus synaptic signaling may encode sub-features of an experience, driving sub-patterns of gene expression. And in summary, gene expression in relevant brain regions will inform of specific features of an experience, providing information regarding plasticity at the circuit level. How can we go about addressing these notions that I'll take the next <coughs> two, three minutes to go through. It does feel like 30 minutes feels like two hours here. There's some, something in the air here that uh, causes time to expand enormously. Uh, so within the accumbens, and, and I promise to be brief on this, uh, within the accumbens we have two types of uh, medium spiny neurons. They come in two flavors, D1 and D2. D1 are the direct pathway neurons, D2 indirect pathway, D1 are thought to be the ones that are more prominently involved in forward acting and coding of an experience, and D2 are thought to uh, more antagonize their function and keep, um, uh, keep the activity, uh, to, to balance the activity of D1. So if we now take uh, D1 cream mice and we drop a, a potassium channel into the D1 neurons, shutting their activity down, uh, so here you can see control mice that develop sensitization to cocaine, but these mice um, fail to develop behavioral sensitization to cocaine. Mind you, this is preliminary data. Now if we look within these mice and profile transcription for um, 
here in these two examples, CFOS or EGR2, then we can see that if you block the uh, ability of these neurons to fire, you lose the capacity of cocaine to induce CFOS, but actually the induction of EGR2 seems to be relatively unaffected. So we can start teasing out the involvement of um, neuronal firing versus potentially other types of inputs coming in, and the reciprocal experiment would, of course, be using dopamine pharmacology. Um, another uh, thing that, we, that uh, we're doing is, uh, so we looked at this gene EGR2, you saw its induction, and uh, when we look at where it's induced, we see that it's induced within a subpopulation of these D1 neurons. We, so this uh, gave us the idea that perhaps uh, the neuronal ensemble that is encoding a given cocaine experience can be captured using EGR2 cream mice, which we then set about to do. So we dropped a double flux cassette into these EGR2 cream mice, and uh, we gain access to a small number of neurons within the nucleus accumbens, and again, um, in very pr preliminary data, we see that uh, if we block the activity of these cells, then you see an indication that uh, they are um, involved in the behavioral sensitization to cocaine, but again, mind you, this is preliminary. And then this gives us access to these neurons and we can profile specifically within them, enhance our understanding of the network and ask many additional questions. As promised, I'll and within 30 minutes, uh, not before acknowledging the heroes of, of this behavioral transcriptomics story. It was um, most of the work that I showed and uh, a lot of the concepts uh, were uh, the contribution of uh, Diptendu, who's a PhD student in the lab. Uh, Bogna is a postdoctoral fellow who joined the lab a year ago and contributed enormously to the uh, work with the additional experiences beyond cocaine. They were heavily assisted by other members of our molecular team in the lab. Uh, Chagit Turm, the lab manager, Liz Isaacson, a master's student, Daron Haritan, and, and Nobleist, an undergraduate student, and uh, Ben, a new PhD student in the lab. And very importantly, um, our great neighbors and friends, Alon Zaslavel and his PhD student, Eyal Itzkovic, uh, helped us with the computational analysis, both these three-dimensional plots and um, the machine learning algorithms to look at um, the segregation of transcription and our ability to uh, identify uh, experiences based on transcription. Uh, these are our funding agencies. I thank the university for allowing me to uh, perform science within its corridors and help us with funding and thank you for your attention.